Okay, welcome to uh, Psych 235 Child Psychology. Today we're talking about middle childhood, uh, chapter 13, uh, psychosocial development. So it's pretty interesting. We're gonna talk about uh, these things over here. We're gonna talk about the self-concept. Um, talking about that isn't always interesting, but today it is, okay? Because uh, we'll talk about related issues like self-esteem as well. We're gonna talk about family, which is gonna be very interesting in the types of families, okay? And which types of families have the best outcomes. Uh, we're going to talk about peers, and I think bullying and aggressive behavior, uh, we won't get to. And depending on how we're doing on time, um, <clears throat> I may not get to peers. My goal is to get to peers and get that done, but uh, we'll see. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started, and let's talk about the self-concept. We're talking about middle childhood, right? The ages 6 to 11 around there <clears throat> for Freud and Erickson for Freud is ages 7 to 11 but this is middle childhood these are very important school years right very um, a very important time for children which that helps them develop their self concept and helps them develop a, a sense of um, self esteem okay uh, if things go well so during middle childhood children uh, are developing their sense of self right and it helps them shape their goals helps them shape the beliefs of what, how they, what they think about themselves, what they're gonna do with themselves and uh, <clears throat> how they feel about themselves. Remember that the self-concept is basically an understanding of oneself and our competencies, right? So it's an idea of who we are, right? Who are we? Uh, what are we good at? You know, what are we not so good at? What are we meant for? That kind of stuff. An idea of who you are is basically your self-concept, okay? Um, the stages, uh, for Freud's theory that have to do with this, it is, has to, is called the latency period, age seven to 11. That's what Freud called the latency period. Latency or latent means that it's hidden. So this is a, um, a time according to Freud when children repress those uh, sexual urges, right? That emerge during the phallic stage. And instead, so they repress these urges and instead the energy, the impulses, are redirected toward developing cognitive skills, social concerns, friendships, things like that. <clears throat> so mastery of uh, basically uh, skills in school, friendships in school, these are very important school years, okay? That's what Freud said about um, middle childhood, okay? Erickson said something very similar, believe it or not. Um, for Erickson, um, it's six to 11 years of age, at, you know, the stage, right? And uh, it's called industry versus inferiority, the name of this stage. So it has to do with industry versus inferiority. So are you be, gonna become industriousness, industrious and productive or are you gonna develop a sense of inferiority? So <clears throat> again, children at this time are, are in school and they're mastering some very important skills. Okay, so children try to, try to master abilities valued by the culture and see themselves as competent or inferior. So those children that do well in school that compare well, doing well in math, let's say, uh, in reading and writing, <clears throat> that master these abilities, um, basically um, they feel good about themselves. And those that aren't doing very well, and it could be for various reasons, it could be that they have a learning disability, it could be because they have problems at home and they, they can't focus, they could have psychological problems, um, but these children that aren't doing well will see themselves as, as inferior and that will affect your sense of competency right? <clears throat> How well you think you can do things and it will affect your self-esteem. So according to Erickson, this is a time when children compare themselves. They compare themselves to other children and they want to see where they stand relative to other children. And if they compare well, they feel good about themselves and they have a sense of industriousness that they can get things done. If they don't compare well, then they have a sense of inferiority and low self-esteem. <clears throat> Makes a lot of sense. You'll see when we talk about the rest of the chapter that this kind of stuff is really happening during this stage of development. Let's keep going. All right, so let's talk about self-esteem. <clears throat> yes, your self-concept, um, you know, will affect your self-esteem. If you have a positive self-concept, right? You think things about yourself that are positive, you think you're competent, things like that, then you'll have good self-esteem. If you have a negative self-concept, it usually means you'll have lower self-esteem, okay? So cognitive ability, right, is developing further, further during middle childhood, right? Our abilities, right? Ability to, to solve problems, to remember things, right? To read and write well, all these things are developing further. And children become more objective, okay? Children judge themselves uh, 
<clears throat> differently now. They compare themselves with others. No longer do they believe just what mommy and daddy tell them because mommy and daddy, if they're good parents, are always going to tell you that you're smart, right? Uh, that you can do things well. That's what good parents do. But by this time, children realize that, you know, some children are even better than they are or that um, they're doing quite poorly compared to others or that they're doing very well. So children become more objective. They become more realistic <clears throat> when it comes to uh, what they think about themselves. And it has to do with comparing themselves with others, where they stand relative to others, okay? They assess their strengths and weaknesses, right? They think about what they're good at, what they're not so good at, okay? And they're comparing themselves to others, right? And they recognize that they have desirable and undesirable qualities. They recognize that there are things about them that are good and desirable, right? Uh, maybe the abilities in a certain area, <clears throat> or maybe they're decent looking, whatever it is, but they also recognize they have undesirable qualities. Maybe they struggle in some areas, or maybe they're not so well behaved, for, for instance, right? So children are comparing themselves and they wanna see where they stand, right, relative to others. Uh, and this affects how they feel about themselves. This affects their self-esteem. Your self-esteem, remember, is basically how you feel about yourself. Your self-concept is what you think of yourself and your self-esteem is how you feel about yourself, okay? So self-esteem, to define it right, a feeling of confidence and satisfaction with oneself. So how you feel about yourself, like I said. So because children are more objective, they're more realistic in, in how they think about themselves, right? Self-esteem actually declines during middle childhood. It actually goes down on average, I should say, right? Uh, before this, you know, in early childhood, children feel, feel pretty good about themselves as long as they have good parents. Parents tell them they're good looking, that they're wonderful, that they're smart, and that they can do anything as long as they put their mind to it. And children usually believe that. They feel pretty good about themselves. By this time, they start judging themselves, I guess, more by, comparison, by comparing themselves with others. They're more realistic. And they realize that, you know, mommy and daddy have actually been very nice in how they see them. But the real world is uh, a little bit different. They realize they're not as wonderful, as smart, or whatever as, uh, as mommy and daddy tell them, okay? Um, <clears throat> the average kid is not as wonderful as their parents think. And, and as parents, we're also uh, biased as well. We think our children are smarter and better looking and better behaved than they actually are. And we are that way because we love our children and we think the best of them, if you are a good parent. Now, there are some parents, of course, who are different. So, but during this time, children think about things more realistically, right, by comparison. And they realize that they're not that good <laughs> compared to others, right? Some of them are average, some of them are below, some of them are actually doing well, but on average, they feel worse about themselves than during early childhood. Self-esteem actually goes down. And here's an important study that um, I don't think is in your book. Um, I haven't looked recently, but I know I, um, I've read about this study. <clears throat> but um, important study that was done by Harder in 1998 he identified that there's five types of competencies related to self-esteem. To put it another way, there are five things that children care about when it comes to their self-esteem, five things that affect their self-esteem. And one of those is scholastic competence. In other words, how well are they doing in school as far as their, uh, you know, um, you know, their academics? Athletic competence, right? How athletic are they? Likeability by peers. Okay, so how, uh, how popular are they? How much do people like them? Physical appearance, how good looking are they? And behavioral conduct, how well behaved are they? Are they? Okay, these five things, according to Harder, are what affects children's self-esteem the most during this time, during middle childhood. And what he found is that most children have what he called a sawtooth profile. In other words, they're high on some things, medium on others, low on others, right? Um, there's variation across these uh, uh, five uh, types of competencies. It's rare that you'll have a child that's high on all of them, although such children do exist. And those are the children that, you know, that other children co sometimes complain about. Oh, here comes little Miss Perfect, right? Or Mr. Perfect, right? And sometimes these, you know, <laughs> these kids are picked on for that reason. But um, there are kids like that, okay? And there are also kids who may be low on most of them, you know, and would have very low self-esteem. Um, but most children are, have a sawtooth profile, up and down right? They might be low, medium, high, medium, high, right? On these things uh, in that order, okay? Scholastic, athletic, likability, physical appearance, and behavioral conduct, okay? Um, <clears throat> to give you an example about uh, myself, uh, when I was this age, if I think back to this time, um, 
believe it or not, scholastically, uh, academically, uh, I was average. You know, I wasn't trying that hard and I was average. You know, I didn't seem particularly bright or special. Athleticism, believe it or not, I was pretty good. Um, in my elementary school, I was like the fa fastest kid in school when we had our little junior Olympics and stuff. So I felt pretty good about my athletic ability. I've always been pretty athletic. And when I moved on to high school and stuff like that, I got older. I joined the basketball team. I, I played on the, I was on the track and field team. I played tennis for a little bit. So I was, I was athletic uh, from the beginning. So I felt pretty good about that. Like I believe my peers, you know, I was in the middle. I wasn't super popular, but I wasn't disliked either. Physical appearance, um, believe it or not, I thought I was a good looking kid. And I think I was, if you look at some of my old pictures, I'm a lot older now, okay? Um, <clears throat> but I think I was a pretty good looking kid. So I felt okay about that. Behavioral conduct, believe it or not, I was not very well behaved. I talked too much. I would get up out of my seat a lot. My teachers would complain about me. And, um, and they punished me several times. There was one time I didn't get to go to a field trip because um, I was so badly behaved. I wasn't really doing anything that bad but I would get up out of my seat a lot, you know, and I don't, you know, maybe to go and get a drink of water. There was a water fountain on the, you know, in the classroom or because I was talking or not paying attention or something like that. I remember one time I was there on my seat and uh, I didn't really know what was happening. And then before I knew it, all the kids were in groups working with other kids. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? Right. I, so I wasn't the best behaved kid. Okay. And I got punished sometimes for that, but I wasn't a bad kid either. So I was up and down. Okay. It wasn't until later, by the way, that I actually found that I was smart. That wasn't until junior high, okay? Because I didn't really care at this time, right? Um, but um, to tell you something else, right? Uh, important children can have similar profiles, but differ in self-esteem. There are other children that can have, you know, one child can have like the same profile here, low, medium, high, medium, high on these same things, right? Two children with the same profile, but one can feel relatively okay about themselves. Another one can feel really bad. It depends on what the child thinks is important or what the culture values. So if a culture really values, for instance, physical appearance, but the child doesn't have high physical appearance, right? Does, isn't very good looking. They may not feel very good about themselves despite the fact that they're okay on the, in the other areas. Or one child might be the same level when it comes to physical appearance and have the same profile on the other things, but they can feel better about themselves because, um, they're raised in an environment where physical appearance is not as important, perhaps, right? Or let's say athletic ability. Athletic ability is considered very important here in the U.S. We love our sports here, right? Um, and and for, for some people, that matters a lot. And if they're not athletic, they don't feel too good about themselves, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the importance of types matter, right? If you value physical appearance and you're low on it, you're not going to have high self-esteem. Or if you value athleticism and you're low on that, you're not going to value high self-esteem. And it depends, it varies by culture, varies, varies by ethnicity, it varies by, uh, by nation. Here in the US, based on my perception, I can tell you that we vary looks a lot, right? Good looking people are treated a lot better. Uh, we, I mean, we vary, we value uh, looks a lot, so physical appearance. Uh, we also value athletic ability. Um, we don't value academic ability as much as we should, by the way. At least not in the kind of schools that I grew up in, right? If you were smart, they called you a nerd and a dork. And I think that's a pretty common thing. When you're smart, other kids pick on you. And in reality, smart kids should be popular kids, right? If, if children understood the importance of being smart, right? Being smart is, uh, is so important. It is probably one of the most important things, by the way. Uh, put it to you this way. If you're smart, okay? To some extent, it's like winning the lottery. You have a path out of poverty if you're born poor. If you live in a country that provides opportunities like the US, right? Uh, being smart is a way, um, is basically like saying, okay, you have potential. If you just apply yourself, you're going to do, you're going to do great things and you'll be out of that poverty. You'll, uh, you'll be able to do well. And not everybody's born with that. It's a very important thing that not everybody has. And I realize that now I've always took it for granted, right? I'm smart. So is my wife. I have a son that's special ed and doesn't come across as smart. Maybe he still is, but I realize now how important that is and how much it affects your potential and, and of course your future. You know, I'm, I'm hoping my son will have a good future, but I don't know, right? I don't know how he's gonna end up, but he has good parents. And if we have to, we'll take care of him, okay? <clears throat> we'll see. 
But that's what Harder said, some very important things about self-esteem there. And there were a couple of questions about that on the exam that shouldn't have been there. So I got a little bit ahead, a little bit ahead of myself. Here's other information about this. Are you satisfied with your performance in math? You can see the graph there, uh, US students and um, Chinese students, students from China. You can see that uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, students in the US, um, look at the yes columns there. Um, more of them are actually satisfied with their ability in math than not. Less, a smaller percentage of them said no. Look at China. China, you have the reverse. Most students are not satisfied with how well they're doing in math. And it's only a small percentage of students, about 15% looks like, that actually are satisfied with their performance in math. And if you've been paying attention to what I said about testing, uh, Chinese students on average do a lot better in math than US students. So why do they feel worse about their performance in math? Because they have higher standards. Their culture really values that. For a Chinese student to feel like they're really good on, in math, they have to be among the top. They have to do, be doing exceptionally. Not good enough, right? So for the US students, like, hey, I'm getting a C. Yeah, I'm good at math. It's like, no, you're not. You just you know, don't know how bad you are compared to other countries. Other countries are really kicking our butt, especially in math, especially those Asian countries. They really value math. And there's a lot of them that are super good at math. And that's the stereotype, right? That Chinese students are good at math and they're good at science and they're gonna get the highest scores in the class in college and stuff like that. And often those stereotypes are fulfilled. They have much higher standards than we do. So a lot of them actually think they're not that good at math when they actually are. Compared to Americans, they are. <clears throat> Just to tell you how self-esteem can differ depending on how the culture values a certain subject or a certain you know, skill, okay? Or a certain category of competency. Let's talk about family now, okay? And this is gonna get us into some very important things, okay? Um, let's talk about family functions. What do families do for children, okay? Families do lots of things, okay? They do these five things, according to research. Families provide food, clothing, and shelter, and that's very important, of course. Families also encourage learning, or they should, right? They get kids to school and motivate them to do well. Right? It's a pain in the butt to get your kids to school, especially during a, you know, normal circumstances. You have to drive them there in the cold and the heat or whatever it is, crowded you know, parking lots and everything. And, and then you have to rush off to work after that. But you encourage children to go to school. You get them there, right? And you motivate them to do well. You tell them to do well. You have high expectations, hopefully. Right? Uh, families help children develop self-esteem. Families keep child make children feel competent, loved, and appreciated. Right? Good parents should tell their children that they're smart, that they're capable, right? And that they can do anything as long as they put their mind to it. Even though they learn later on that there's certain things they're good at, certain things they're not so good at, right? Families still encourage them and say, okay, well, you, we just need to work on this other thing and you'll get better at it. Or, uh, or focus on what you are good at, right? And develop that skill and you'll do well. <clears throat> Families also uh, um, should nurture friendships with peers. Families should provide opportunities, the time, space, you know, uh, and the social skills for peer relationships. You need to give your children opportunities, right? Uh, the time, right? To take them to the park, take them to see their, uh, their cousins, their extended family, take them to different places where they can interact with other kids. And one of those places is school. Provide the space, you know, little play dates at your, in your home, um, in the yard, right? Or different places, right? <clears throat> Provide those opportunities and teach them social skills, how to talk to other kids, how to play, um, that kind of stuff, that's important. I know right now we don't we have a situation where that isn't uh, done so easily, okay? Uh, because we have a virus that is spreading. Um, however, uh, you know it's still uh, important, okay? And um, you know, well, <laughs> you know there are ways around this. There is Zoom like we're using now, um, or maybe if you keep it within your own family limit, limit the exposure. Maybe you'll still be okay, but. Um, if you're following the rules, then children are kind of suffering in this area, okay? Because you need to keep people away from other people at this point in time. I don't know how many people are following the rules. I am, okay? My family is for the most part. Uh, most of the time, sometimes I know we're not as good as we should be, okay? Uh, families also provide harmony and stability. Families provide safety, security, right? Predictable routines, right? You have a home that you go to. You have a routine. Certain time you get up and you go to bed. Uh, you have a pattern of how you do things. All this has to do with predictable outcomes, right? With stability, you know, security. You keep your children safe and you give them shelter, right? All that is important. That is what families do. And there's different kinds of families, 
okay? And the best, um, the best outcome or the best situation, if you want better outcomes according to research, is to have what we call a nuclear family, okay? Uh, this provides the best outcomes according to research, okay? So a nuclear family means you have one father, one mother, and you have some children. That's a nuclear family. If you don't have any children, by the way, you're just a couple, all right? But that's a nuclear family. Uh, research shows that uh, <clears throat> in nuclear families, uh, parents are actually wealthier, okay? Better educated, mentally and physically healthier. The parents are usually better off. They're doing better. They have better circumstances, okay? Um, parents are more likely to compromise with their children. They're not as hostile. They're more likely to stay married. They argue less over money. There's more harmony in the home. They get along better and there's more stability. Part of that has to do, of course, with the fact that they're wealthier and that they have less to argue about, okay? It, when money's tied, you argue more, right? And if they're wealthier, often that means they're better educated. Maybe they went on to college, not always, but usually they're better educated, mentally and physically healthier. Okay, um, if you're together, even if you're not college educated, but if you're if you if you have a couple, right, uh, mommy and daddy are there and the children, um, then mommy and daddy can combine incomes and you're usually better off. Okay, with two incomes than one. Not always because sometimes there's one parent that makes a lot of money and the other person doesn't have to work that exists a lot too. But nowadays, most of the time, you need two incomes to make it things have gotten a lot more expensive. In the 70s, you know, only daddy needed to work. Mommy's, uh, you know, could have worked too, right? It wasn't against the law, but uh, in the 70s, you can get, a, uh, get away with just having one income. And that was enough to own your own home and have a car and go on vacations and all that stuff. That is not enough anymore. Things have changed. Now you need two incomes to own a home. And even two incomes doesn't seem to be enough in California. Things have definitely changed. But this is what the research says about nuclear families. It provides the best outcomes because you have two incomes, two people who love each other, hopefully, and they get along better, usually better educated, right? That's what the parents are like. The children are more likely to finish school, right? More likely to obey the law, right? They have good parents that teach them to obey, right? And follow the rules. Uh, they, they're more likely to have happy marriages of their own, the children when they grow up. More likely to pursue fulfilling careers because you know they believe in themselves, right? Um, they attend better schools because they also live in better neighborhoods. They live in bigger houses. They receive better food, better clothes, better shelter, and they also have better health care, by the way. Keeping the family together is important. If mommy and daddy can stay together, right, and you have those two incomes, and they, they basically share the burden of raising kids because it's very difficult to raise kids, then you're usually better off, okay? Um, but it's hard and we have about, you know, half, half the marriages end in divorce and you, you can have other kinds of families, other, other types. So let's talk about those. There's also adoptive and same-sex parents, okay? Adoptive and same-sex parents, uh, families uh, usually function well. Uh, sometimes they can function even better than the average nuclear family, um, but it can vary. Uh, depending, right, um, on the ability to meet the child's needs. It's usually, they usually function well early on, okay, but there can be some problems down the road. So I know there are same-sex couples who adopt, by the way, and research doesn't say, doesn't say really bad things about that. Um, you know, what children actually need um, is, uh, is basically a team, you know, a mommy, a daddy, or two mommies or two daddies, they need a team of people to take care of them. Basically, it usually takes more than one person, uh, you know, to do a good job. It's hard to raise children. It really is. And if you have an adopted family, you know, you're, you know, basically you adopted someone or you have a same sex family that can be okay as well. But there can be some problems on their own, which we're going to talk about right now. I just want to mention first, though, that, by the way, uh, uh, adoptions by same sex couples is actually illegal in some states. Okay. And I know that's just uh, discrimination, right? It's, it shouldn't be that way because the research doesn't say that there's anything bad with same-sex couples adopting. They usually do as well as, uh, as nuclear families. Uh, step families, however, can have some, some problems down the road, okay? Uh, step families usually function well, right? Um, but in, or, in order to have positive relationships with step families, um, usually, um, you know, it, it's, it's easier if the children are under two years of age. So if you do have a step family, what that means is that basically, you know, uh, the mommy and daddy, the, their marriage didn't work out or the relationship didn't work out and they had a child together. 
and then they separate or get divorced. And then basically mommy marries somebody else. And then uh, basically that person that, you know, that man is not your father. So that's a step family. Okay. Or maybe daddy got custody of the children and he then remarried. So now you have a step mom that can happen too. Right. Step families usually function well, especially if children are under age two, right. When you form this new family, it's more difficult with teenagers. Teenagers on the other hand, do not take it very well. Right. When they have a quote, a new mommy or a new daddy, they usually don't like that and are not as accepting of that new person. A solid parental alliance is more difficult to form, right? It is, it's just more difficult for that teenager to accept this other person as basically, uh, you know, even if it's just their stepfather or, or whatever it is, or their, their new daddy or the new mommy, you know, it's harder. They're, you know, they often don't wanna do that. Or the person, the new, the stepfather or stepmother doesn't have the authority. The child won't listen to you. And they'll tell you things. You're not my real mom. You're not my real dad. I don't have to listen to you right? Especially when you have problems, which you will with teenagers. Uh, child, so it's, it's important that both mommy and daddy, right? Uh, actually, that both uh, parents actually uh, agree on how they're going to parent the kids. And when there's punishment or rewards, whatever, they both agree on that, that there aren't disagreements about one child, one parent wants to punish the child, the other one the other one doesn't want to punish the child and then you have disagreements and when you have a stepchild it, that can be that can cause a lot of problems because it usually means that you can have that you know basically the child can be more uh allied with uh with his biological parent than the other parent and and they can be against each other and then one person feels left out okay child loyalty to parents is often undermined by disputes yeah so you know mommy can protect the child doesn't let daddy you know, be a be the daddy doesn't let him be the father and doesn't let, let him punish the child, you know, and that will undermine the, you know, the, uh, the family because the child now has no authority. I mean, the father has now no authority because mommy is protecting the child and that's her child, but it's not his child. It's not his biological child. So there can be problems in that sense. And you'll see this, right? If you, if you adopt children, when they become teenagers, um, they will, likely question your authority and tell you things like you're not my dad you're not my mom right i don't have to listen to you and it can be hard okay but if you get them early then they're more likely to adjust to you and more likely to see them as you know as basically as um, as a, more of a parental figure you can tell them later on you're not the real dad um, but they're more likely to accept you because they've been with you since they were children and you've met a lot of their early needs which is you know you you did a lot of bonding it's harder to have that bonding if you have a teenager, right? If you're, you know, if you have a step adoptive family uh, and you form the family when kids are teenagers. Uh, grandparent family, also it's called the skip generation family. Um, you know, this is when you have grandparents raising uh, children. Sometimes it's because the parents couldn't do it. Maybe the parents uh, passed away. Uh, maybe the parents uh, just have uh, economic problems and they can't afford to, uh, to raise you, for instance, as a child, or parents are locked up in jail, or uh, we even have situations where, uh, where parents get deported, you know, and the child has, now has to be raised by grandparents. It happens a lot, or the parent, or, or, the, or the, let's say the parents are too young and uh, immature and they can't raise the child. They're not responsible enough. Sometimes grandparents will step in and raise the children. It happens. Um, these families are usually lower income. Remember, grandparents are usually retired or they grew up at a different time and they, they tend to have lower pay, okay? Especially if they're on a fixed income. They're more likely to have health problems because they're older and, um, you know, they provide less stability, okay? Because they're, uh, you know, they're older and their health can suffer and, you know, and they may or may not be uh, able to take care of the children when those things happen. These kind of families often involve grandchildren with health or behavioral problems who are less likely to succeed in school. Often, yes, um, the children themselves will have uh, health and behavior problems. Behavioral problems in this, often the behavioral problems they have is because they may not come from parents who are very responsible to begin with and the parents didn't do a very good job and the child already has psychological problems because the parents didn't do a good job early on and then somebody had to step in and raise the children. Um, or because the, you know, the children were, you know, abused or something like that or neglected. 
um, or or genetically, it could be that uh, you know that the parents are just not that responsible. That maybe they're aggressive and impulsive, and they're just different, and the child has that same genetics. Um, so for that reason as well, right? And they could have health problems as well. They might have been exposed to things that were harmful. Um, maybe the parents were drug users and they harmed the child during prenatal development, whatever. For all sorts of reasons, they can have health and behavior problems. Often it's just, it's not that the parents, uh, it's, well, it could also be, and I've seen this, uh, it, the children can also be very upset and just uh, very angry and resentful about the fact that they're not with mommy and daddy, that their grandparents are raising them instead. And they can be, they can misbehave and give you a lot of trouble because of this, because they're, they want to be with their mommy and daddy. And because of that, they're angry, they're resentful. And then you have grandparents trying to raise them and the children are difficult. I've seen all that happen. Okay. Uh, these children also tend to receive fewer services. Um, you know, when they do have special needs, um, grandparents are often less knowledgeable about the services that are available. Um, <clears throat> Or uh, they may not be willing to do everything that uh, that's required, right? Um, you know, to get them those services. Uh, I'll give you a, a, an example. Well, for my own family, uh, my son is on the autism spectrum, so he goes to speech therapy twice a week. Uh, he also has occupational therapy, different kind of therapy, uh, and he's in special ed. And there's all these meetings and there's all this stuff, right? Uh, you know. For me and my wife, uh, for my wife and I, as, uh, you know, as the parents of the child, we, we love our child, we'll do everything for him, right? Um, and it's not that grandparents don't love their children, but it can be a real burden for them to do all this stuff, especially if they're older and maybe they can't even drive anymore or can't drive safely, um, or they just, uh, it's just too tiring for them, but they tend to receive, you know, less services. And often they may not be aware that these services exist. If you have a special needs child, by the way, your child qualifies for services, even if you don't have health care and things like that, and you don't have to pay for them. Okay. At least that's the way it is in California. I don't know if that's the way it is in every state. And often grandparents don't know this stuff. Um, other families, blended families, <clears throat> blend, with blended families, what that means is you have many adults. You can have grandparents there, aunts and uncles, right? Your parents, you have many adults living together under one household, right? Uh, there could be grandparents, like I said, there could be, uh, you know, mommy's there and, you know, there, you know, and you're living there with mommy, but mommy's boyfriend's also, also living there, or there could be a girlfriend if it's your dad, right? And, you know, you have another, he has another, he has a girlfriend or something and broke up with your mom, right? Aunts, uncles, that kind of stuff. And this often happens because uh, parents need to help each other out, you know, especially nowadays, it's tough, you know, things are expensive. And what sometimes you'll have multiple families living under the same roof. And uh, children, in these families, research shows can, you know, usually do quite well, but they can have problems. The outcomes is, are not as good as in nuclear families, right? Uh, but they are better than single parent families, which we'll talk about in a moment. But there are disagreements over child rearing, right? Uh, the parents may disagree with the grandparents and because the grandparents in, uh, are there, they want to, uh, you know, step in and get involved or provide their, uh, you know, their uh, expertise, so to speak. And there can be disagreements about that. Okay. This can produce stress for children. You have multiple adults who treat the child uh, in different ways. Children exposed to stress and conflict do worse in school. Children who have problems at home are also going to have problems in school usually because their self-esteem, their motivation will suffer, their willingness to learn, right? And their ability to learn, they're not as focused. Okay, that's blended families, um, which, you know, are, are common, especially with the kind of uh, environment that we have nowadays where everything is so expensive, where you have to have multiple, sometimes multiple families living together. Other types of families, um, the worst situation, I'm sorry to say this, are one parent families. You have uh, one parent, raising a child or raising multiple children, it's harder to make it with one parent, okay? There's fewer income usually, okay? And I mean, there's just less income. You have, you know, only one income and there's only one of you, only one person to do everything the child needs. And it's just sometimes not possible to do everything that's required. It usually involves single unmarried mothers and they provide less stable environment. Usually, yes, when, um, when uh, a couple has a child and then the relationship doesn't work out, it's usually uh, the mother who ends up with the kids, not the father, okay? Uh, even if you were married and then you got divorced, right? It's usually the mother who ends up with the child. Uh, mothers are just, uh, 
they're just better at raising kids than fathers on average. Sometimes the father does get custody, that does happen, uh, but it's, it's a lot more rare, right? And in those cases, you know, the father would have to prove that he can do a better job than the mother and that he deserves custody. And that can happen. For instance, if the mother doesn't have a job and, you know, can't provide a stable environment or, you know, or the mother has drug problems, but the father does not and the father's the responsible one, that can happen as well. Uh, but it's usually single unmarried mothers, okay? That's what uh, they, they, they were never married. They had, you know, uh, a child, right? Uh, it could have been a teenage pregnancy or something like that. And it's, it's uh, you have a single parent now. <clears throat> Most of them are young, okay? Poor, and they, you know, they change jobs often. And then they have repeated romances, okay? So they're young and poor, right? They're young, they don't have good jobs, right? Um, you know, um, usually, uh, you know, they're, they can't go to college because they're raising this child and they're working at the same time. There are plenty of people who try, okay? I know some of you may fall into this category. It's just hard to raise a child, go to school and have a job all at the same time, right? So they tend to be younger and poor, right? And they change jobs often. They tend to have jobs that don't pay very well. You know, jobs that, uh, you know, you don't have to really be loyal to because they don't treat you that well. They don't pay you that well. They don't have good benefits, okay? Uh, repeated romances, they're young and they're gonna meet somebody and get involved with somebody romantically. The other relationship didn't work out. Uh, that'll happen. And they'll get involved with one person that doesn't work out, then another one, another one. And this is what happens um, because you as a single mother, believe it or not, uh, are now that you have somebody else's child, you are a less desirable romantic partner for somebody. And sure, there are people who will date you, will be with you, but for them to commit with you, to you and stay with you and marry you, um, that, well, that's gonna be harder, okay? And you're likely to be with one person, then another and another, and uh, this is what happens. People can use you, okay? You can still find a good man, you know, a good person who will stick by you, and it has a lot to do with, you know, what you offer, you know? Um, <clears throat> if you're a good person, you know, if you have, if you bring something to the relationship, thing good, um, obviously it's easier if you're better looking as well, okay? All that matters. <clears throat> Okay, um, these children usually in these one parent families usually go through many changes. Cohabitation, right? Um, they may live, uh, you know, you have a, you know, the, the child may live with, uh, you know, um, the mother and the mother's boyfriend, and then that doesn't work out. And then they go later on and live with somebody else, right? Maybe with the parents and then again with another boyfriend and things like that. They get married, get divorced again, right? Um, <clears throat> if you've been divorced, by the way, once already, uh, there's a higher chance you're going to get divorced the second time. Okay, that's what the research shows. Okay, uh, marriage, staying together, raising a family is just hard, and divorce is common. Okay, it, you know, especially when you have these one parent families, it's just the likelihood of divorce is even greater. Okay, there's more stress, more frustration is transmitted to children. As a single mother, right, raising a child, it's going to be hard for you. You're going to get mad, you're going to get frustrated, and you're more likely to yell at your kids and cuss them out, maybe even beat them. That's what the research shows. I know I was raised by that. You know, I was raised by a single mother. She raised five kids on her own. And trust me, we went through quite a bit. We went through neglect. We went through abuse, right? Uh, some of us even experienced sexual abuse. My mother would beat us, cuss us out, right? Uh, she was just mean and frustrated. She's not a bad person, but she was mad. She was frustrated, right? And she met uh, someone and, you know, we call them our stepdad, even though they never got married. He came around once a while and, um, you know, and sometimes would stay the night and sometimes he wouldn't and stuff like that. But this helped my mother because he provided income, although he didn't live with us. We actually found out later on, by the way, that this man that was coming around was actually already married to somebody else. And my mom was actually the other woman. <laughs> okay, We didn't know this, but he would come around, would be about with my mom and he helped us out a lot financially. He was a man of means, okay? Children in single parent families uh, can rebel if attention is directed to a new adult, a new, you know, or stepchildren, right? You hook up with somebody else, not hook up is not the right word, but you get involved with somebody else, let's say a new relationship, uh, your child may not accept that new person, may not like it, right? Or that, or you get involved with somebody else and they have children too, and they may not get along with those stepchildren. Children are more likely to quit school, more likely to leave home, more likely to become delinquent and be single uh, mothers and single, you know, single mothers themselves later on. Single fatherhood is also, can also happen, but that's a lot less common. So sad to say this happens a lot, but it's the worst outcomes for children, okay? And I know because I was raised by a single parent and trust me, it's hard. It's, it's, 
it's remarkable that uh, in my family that we wound up the way we did because we had all the problems, poverty. Uh, you know, there was drugs around us. There was abuse. We would get beaten. Some of us got sexually abused. Like I said, there was neglect. It was everything. Okay. And it's just amazing that we wound up the way we did. And the reason why, just to tell you a little bit more, the reason why, because we had one very important thing that I think we mostly inherited from our fathers, <laughs> which is the one who was bad, by the way, who beat my mom and my mom left him. Um, we were all pretty smart. And like I told you guys, being smart is a very, very important thing. If you have that, consider yourself lucky. It's your ticket to a better life, even if you're born poor, right? But you have to work hard and you have to keep trying even when you fail, because even I failed and had to pick myself up and get going again. Um, let's talk about other family challenges. Let's see how we're doing on time. Um, we're doing okay. Uh, other family uh, fa Family challenges. There's two factors in general that increase the likelihood of dysfunction in every type of family, with every structure, whether you have nuclear family, single parent, blended family, whatever it is, in any ethnic group, in any nation, there's two important factors that increase the problems, that increase the likelihood that you're going to have problems. You're going to have a dysfunctional family. And I grew up in one of those families, very dysfunctional, by the way. Uh, one of those is low income or poverty. Right. If you're low income, if you're poor, that's one thing that's going to cause a lot of problems. And the other thing is just conflict, having problems in general, not getting along with others, not getting along with the other person, with the children. Um, harmony at home. So here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, children will suffer if family members fight and everybody fights. And this this does affect children. Children suffer if family members fight, especially if it's physical, if physical and verbal abuse is present, okay? If there's physical abuse and they're beating each other up, of course, it's not good for children to see that. Um, it, it's just really bad, okay? Um, even if there's just verbal abuse, okay, where you're cussing each other out, where it gets so bad, the, the arguments, that you're cussing each other out and yelling at each other and the children see this stuff. You know, you need to try to keep your fights private, but it isn't always possible, all right? I've had many arguments with my wife at first, you know, it was like, yeah, hey, you know, stop yelling at me. The children are present. Try not to fight with me right now, right? Eventually got to the point where it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> we fight in front of the kids. Um, but it usually doesn't get to the point of verbal abuse. Verbal abuse is when you're really mad, you're yelling at each other and cussing each other out. And that can be very, very hurtful. And, you know, the child, children see how bad their parents can be, right? And uh, they verbal abuse each other. And guess what? The sad thing is when your children grow up, they're more likely to verbally abuse each other and uh, abuse other people. I've seen situations where, um, you know, in my, uh, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with my cousins, right, that they were brought up in that kind of a family where the parents were always cussing each other out and stuff like that. And when the children got older and they were teenagers, they were cussing out the mom now and verbally abusing her. That's what happens. That's what children learn. <clears throat> Children can benefit from separation, right? If the parents separate, if the parents are openly, openly hostile to one another, if the parents are fighting in front of each other and beating each other up and they're doing this in front of the kids, um, the parents being separated will actually be better for the children. They won't experience that. They won't see that because that's actually very damaging for children. Children don't actually benefit from separation or divorce if the parents divorce or separate <clears throat> because they're dissatisfied or distant with each other. It's because, you know, if they just, uh, you know, are sexually dissatisfied, or maybe daddy wants a younger wife or something like that, uh, and they're just dissatisfied with each other. They don't please each other anymore. Divorcing for that reason, separating for that reason, doesn't do children uh, any, any good, right? It actually harms them because there, weren't, there wasn't a, a lot of conflict to begin with, and children you know, want their parents to be together. They want to see both their parents, right? And when you separate, what usually happens is one parent isn't around very much, okay? <clears throat> All family transitions affect children. Changing jobs, right? Changing homes, changing romantic partners, divorce, separation, you know, changing schools, all this affects children and will create stress, okay? More children are more likely to quit school, right? More likely to be delinquent, right? More likely to have early love affairs themselves, right? When they're brought up and all, where all this stress, all this chaos, all these problems. <clears throat> yes, and I've been through all of that, okay? Um, let's talk about family income now. Family income correlates with, with, uh, with both uh, function and structure. All the five functions of family that we talked about, providing food and shelter and providing opportunities for uh, develop peer relations, all those things that we talked about, income affects all of them, okay? Income is very important. Money affects everything, okay? We live in that kind of world. The family stress model, 
says that any risk factor, whether it's income, divorce, unemployment, will increase stress on the family, okay? In developed nations like the US, poverty does not directly increase stress. Children usually still have adequate food and clothing. So in the US, even if, uh, even if you're poor, you're not gonna starve to death, okay? Uh, usually you can still have clothes, you can still have a, you know, a place to live. You know, there are places that will help you, especially if you have children. Um, so poverty doesn't directly increase stress. Poverty indirectly increases stress. Be what it does is basically it makes parents more harsh, more hostile, more aggressive. Um, and then parents take it out on their children. That's what happens. And that's what I've experienced with, you know, with, um, with, with my mom. You know, it's just, uh, you know, she was raising five kids, four boys and one girl, by the way. And as boys, we were difficult. Um, and uh, yeah, my mom was mean, you know, and that's, she was, she was angry and frustrated. And she would get up at four in the morning to go to work. Her job started at five and she worked for some factory where they hardly pay, paid her anything. And I remember, you know, she was making very little money and she would get like a, an increase every year of like 10 cents per hour. It was nothing. She was actually getting poor every year. And she was mad, she was frustrated. And she would take it on us. She would beat the crap out of us, whip us with a belt, right? Slap us, right? Hit us with, uh, you know, la chancla and stuff like that. Uh, especially the boys, you know, and she, she would beat the crap out of us every now and then. So parents are usually more angry, more depressed, not as loving, not as firm or caring uh, when there's low income because of the anger, the frustration, you know? And by the way, racism doesn't make it any better. If you are a minority and you experience that as well, that just makes things more difficult and more frustrating, makes you even more angry. Um, other things about family income, <clears throat> children in high income families actually um, can have emotional problems as well. They can also have problems that can lead to drug use and delinquency. Children in high income families can have problems if their parents pressure them a lot to be superstars. That's a problem we see in high income families. They're high income and they expect their children to be super successful, right? To get straight A's and go to the best colleges. And, uh, and they put a lot of pressure on their kids sometimes. And sometimes because of this, the kids can experience a lot of stress and uh, basically can say, screw you, right? Uh, and become delinquents and do whatever the hell they want. Or what can happen more often is that uh, they can just start smoking weed, start doing drugs, right? To cope with the pressure that the parents are putting on them. But usually children from poor families have more symptoms of mental disturbance. People from poor families usually have more problems in general. Poverty is a risk factor for just about everything. Poor people will always have more problems, more problems with drugs, more problems with aggression, delinquency than children in high-income families. But just to tell you that people in high-income families can also have problems as well, okay? Children in single mother households uh, do much better if the father pays child support or if the nation subsidizes single parents. If you, do, um, if you are a single parent, your children will be better off if the biological father is actually paying child support, okay? Or if you live in a country where single parents get basically uh, money from the government to help them raise children by, just because of the fact that they're single parents. Now here, there is such a thing as uh, food stamps or financial assistance, stuff like that for people who are poor, but not, but not just because you're a you know, a single parent. In some countries, they actually provide people who are specifically single parents with more income to help them out. And that's a very good thing because it helps, it, it helps children. But yeah, think about that, right? It's important that the father pays child support, but often fathers do not pay child support, right? Because it makes them more poor, right? It, it takes away a big chunk of their income. Uh, and in California, they enforce that very strongly, by the way, that fathers need to pay child support, right? And I know that uh, because I had a, I have a cousin who's had like kids with different women and none of those relations have worked out. And he was a teacher for a while, you know, making, you know, okay money, you know, middle class stuff like that. But, you know, he had these children with other women and he wasn't supporting them, taking care of them. And one day he got pulled over by the police because at a traffic light or something like that. And then they found out that he owes a bunch of child support, thousands of dollars, and they arrested him and they threw him in jail. Right? That's what happens in California if you owe a bunch of money. Um, the rest of the family kind of, we, we pitched in, right, to help him out, get him out of jail, help him, you know, kind of catch up to his child support. And he was also going to lose his car as well. He couldn't even afford his car payments after that. Um, so we helped him out, you know, and, and um, you know, basically 
help them get back on his feet because it, they threw him in jail, right? Um, but he wasn't being responsible with child support. But there are some states where they say they care about this stuff, but they will not enforce, uh, you know, the law of, you know, making fathers uh, pay for child support. And you're more likely to be poor in other states, right, when that happens. Other things about families, um, there are children who do well despite these risk factors. Despite these problems, there are still children who still do um, quite well, okay? And these children are said to, do, to be resilient, despite the fact that they're brought up in families that may be single parent families, families where there's abuse and neglect and drug use and crime and all that stuff. Uh, there are children who still do well, okay? And go, do well in school and go on to college and have good careers and good families of their own. And these children are said to be uh, resilient. They have resilience, right? It's the ability to kind of bounce back, the ability to adapt well to significant adversity, to overcome serious stress, right? It's something that I believe that I have that helped me, right? And a lot of my family, uh, my, my brothers and sisters have, because we all went through this and we all wound up okay. Uh, resilient kids develop their own friends. They're good at making friends, right? Um, you know, they, uh, they're involved in activities, they develop skills, right? Uh, they have better emotional and academic function, okay? They, you know, they better able to control their emotions, better able to control themselves, right? And, uh, and they do better in schools. They tend to have an easy temperament, right? Uh, I mean, they follow the rules, they get along with people, right? And, and they tend to have an IQ. Having an IQ is helpful, but it's not essential. If you do have an IQ, a high IQ, assuming that IQ measures you know, intelligence, if you are intelligent, to put it that way, right, uh, that is something that's very protective. That is something where that helps you a lot, where you can still be okay, despite the fact that you've been brought up in an environment that's really bad. And I encounter plenty of uh, students that way, by the way. A lot of students here at the community college who are, you know, who are that way and, uh, and are still doing well despite all their problems, right? Um, but they're at high risk for things going wrong because they have such a dysfunctional environment. But, you know, make sure that you always keep doing well in school and keep trying and that's your ticket out of these, the mess and the problems, okay? Early social support and religious faith helps uh, foster uh, resi resilience and good parents. If you are, if you do have a religious faith, if you do have a, a church that you go to, that's a type of social support that can help children and help you out as a parent and can make you a, a better parent, okay? Religious faith is particularly important for African-American children, right? African-American children, it's particularly important for them to have religious faith, to have, to be basically, to have a church that they go to. Why? Because that is, like I said, that is a, uh, a form of social support, especially when you're African-American, you experience a lot of the racism and discrimination, a lot of the problems, you're treated worse uh, than other people. It's very important to have a community of people who care for you. But for all people, it's, it's, it's helpful, but especially for African-Americans. Uh, let's keep going. Let's talk about peers. We still have about 20 minutes, so let's see if we can talk a little bit about peers and, uh, and, you know, and then we'll be done. Okay. Uh, what are peers? Okay. Um, peers are, uh, we talked about peers before. Peers are children that are roughly the same age, roughly the same social status, right? So they're roughly the same age as you, right? For instance, they same grade level. If you're middle class, they're middle class. You're poor, they're poor, right? People tend to live uh, in similar neighborhoods, similar incomes, right? They work, play, and learn together. Children who have difficulties with peers are more likely to have problems later on, okay? <clears throat> children who don't get along with others, don't develop good relationships, that kind of stuff, right? In middle childhood, children actually care more about the opinions of their classmates. They're less egocentric. They care more about what other children think. They compare themselves, and this affects their self-concept and their self-esteem. Peers provide companionship, right? Validation, your peers make you feel good about yourself, right? Because they're usually just like you. If you're poor, they're poor, right? Usually people also live in uh, neighborhoods where they, they live uh, among people who are similar culturally as well, you know? Um, so they validate you. They tell you that you're okay because they're just like you. You think they're okay, so therefore you're okay. They provide advice, right? P children learn to negotiate you know, to share, to compromise and defend themselves uh, when they have these peer groups, right? Because you negotiate, right? You trade things, you help each other out, you share things, right? Uh, you compromise, you know, whether you're playing sports or playing a game or, or whatever, you know? Um, you, they, children learn to defend themselves, to stick up for themselves. You know, your peers can do that for you as well. And, um, 
it's a very good thing to have. Peers teach lessons adults uh, you know, can't teach. Adults are not your equals. Uh, your peers can teach you things that your parents cannot. Your peers can, you know, can teach you, uh, you know, more or less, uh, for instance, how you should behave in the playground. Your parents don't really know. Things have changed. It was different when they were in school, right? Or how you should maybe uh, want to, uh, um, you know, like the kind of clothes or, or, or maybe wear your hair. Things have to do with that, like getting along with others, being cool, you know, or, or that kind of stuff. Just getting along. Peers can teach you more about that. Um, you know, than parents, because the parents are not there at the playground. They don't know what happens. They don't know what it's like. Could be a very different environment than from there, what they grew up in. Peers are crucial for social growth and adjustment. Peers make you feel good about yourself. They help you develop your identity, right? They help you, uh, you know, be less lonely, less depressed. It's actually a very good thing to have. Friendships are even more useful. Friendships are even, uh, are, are better. Friendships also provide all those functions. Uh, personal friendship is actually more important than peers. Right. There was a study that was done um, that um, looked at different uh, children from different types of home, and it found that children from violent and nonviolent homes have the same number of acquaintances. So both children from violent and nonviolent homes basically have peers, the same number of peers, you could say, right? But children from violent homes are actually less likely to have a close friend. Children from homes where where parents are beating each other up and the children are being abused, that kind of stuff. Those children have more problems making friends. They have more problems getting along with others because they're scared or maybe they're more aggressive, okay? <clears throat> um, learned skills are, are required to uh, acquire close relationships. You need to learn those skills. And if the family is dysfunctional, you don't learn those skills. People don't know how to talk to each other. Uh, these skills are also important to avoid loneliness, isolation, and rejection. You need to learn how to get along with others how to make friends, how to talk to people. And if you don't have good, good role models at home and you have a very dysfunctional family, it's harder. Both peer acceptance, close friends, uh, you know, protect against loneliness and depression. Like I said with peers, well, friendships also do the same thing. They protect you uh, psychologically. It's very, uh, it's very good to have uh, friends, especially close friends. And by this time, uh, of course, uh, children care more about these friendships. So friendships actually become more intense and closer in middle childhood. Children care more about their friends during this time, okay? They want more friends, actually. They're more upset when friendships end. Before this, you know, when you moved and children went to another school, it, was, it wasn't a big deal in early childhood. During middle childhood, now when their friendships are disrupted, they get upset, they get sad, right? They wanna keep their friends. They find it harder to make new friends. Friendships now have to do with what they have in common and relating uh, to each other uh, in things that are meaningful, not just people you play with, not just anybody who's in your class. Older children are pickier about their friends, right? Um, studies have shown that uh, when it comes to your best friend, it's usually someone with similar interests, someone who likes similar things, you know, no matter what it is, I don't know what you guys like, whether it's Star Wars or, you know, or anime or whatever the heck it is, people from similar backgrounds usually you know, culturally, uh, you know, ethnicity, it tends to be the same. Most black people, their best friend is another black person. Most white people, it's another white person. Latino is another Latino. Asian, Asian, you know, usually. Um, but it, there can be exceptions, of, of course. You know, I've heard plenty of stories where your best friend can be someone of a different ethnicity. But people with the same values, usually someone of the same sex, right? Males usually have another male as their best friend. You know, similar age, of course. Social economic status has to do with income level, you know, uh, for Poor children, right? Their best friend is usually somebody else who's poor. If it's someone who's middle class, somebody else is middle class. But you're talking about someone who's rich, right? Their best friend is somebody else who's rich, right? Those are things you have in common. By age 10, most children have at least one best friend. They can say they have more than one, okay? And as they get older, they tend to have fewer closer friends, okay? Um, they'll have less friends, but they'll be closer to those people, but they have fewer of them. And I remember this time when I was a kid, and I was in a dysfunctional family. I actually considered uh, my best friend to be during this time actually my cousin, believe it or not. I considered my cousin my best friend, who was a similar age and stuff. We were similar. He was like about one year older, um, but that was I considered to be my uh, my best friend. I guess probably because you know I didn't know too well how to make friends because my family was so dysfunctional. Actually, all our families were dysfunctional in my extended family. we all we were all poor and all suffered from divorce and separation, all that stuff. It was uh, it was bad. Okay. Um, there are children who are who can be popular and unpopular. We're going to talk about that now. Popular children in the in the U.S. Uh, tend to be children who are 
more kind, more trustworthy, more cooperative, right? Uh, they also tend to be cool or athletic, right? A athletic, cool, dominant, arrogant. Some of them are full of themselves and, you know, they're likable, right? Be you know, because they're high, such high self-esteem, right? Uh, or even aggressive, right? Uh, by around the fifth grade, even children who are aggressive can be, uh, can be popular because they're kind of stand up for themselves. They're dominant, you know? Um, they can be considered as cool, you know? And we'll talk about children who are aggressive in a moment. Uh, not all of them are popular. Okay, we'll talk about a specific form. Okay, unpopular children in the US uh, tend to be neglected. Children who are not very popular are neglected. In other words, here we're talking about uh, neglected by other children. Other children don't notice them, don't talk to them as much. Um, they don't uh, get picked, you know, to be on the team as much. Um, they get left out. Um, it also includes aggressive, rejected kids, kids that are rejected because they don't get along with others, because they're mean and they fight a lot, right? And um, withdrawn, rejected kids, kids that are rejected uh, because they're kind of, uh, um, how should I say, uh, loners, you know, and they don't really talk, they're shy, that kind of stuff. So let's talk about these children. Let's talk about the unpopular children. Uh, first, I want to tell you guys that there was a study that showed that about, um, that compared children about 36%, more than a third of children are considered popular. 47% of them are about average. About 17% of them are rejected. And it's the ones that are rejected that we worry more about. And those would be your unpopular children, okay? Unpopular children come in, you know, three forms that we just mentioned, neglected, aggressive, rejected, and withdrawn, rejected. The neglected children are children who are not really rejected, but they don't get picked to be on the team, for instance. They're not picked as friends. They're avoided by classmates. Not the ideal situation for them, right? They get left out but it doesn't cause any long-term psychological harm. They just get left out for some reason, okay? And then there are the children who are aggressive, rejected. Uh, they're disliked because they're antagonistic and confrontational. They're mean, they tend to fight, they tend to think, take things the wrong way and are easily upset, right? Um, they have problems controlling their emotions, right? You tell them something that uh, isn't so positive and they get mad, even if it wasn't something that was that bad, it was just neutral, they take it the wrong way right? They tend to experience mistreatment at home. They're children who don't know how to control their emotion because they may be being abused at home. And that, that basically makes them uh, uh, so that they're less able to control their emotions. They experience intense emotions or they, or they have bad role models, you know, with their, their parents at home are very aggressive and, you know, uh, committing verbal abuse and physical abuse. So they don't have good role models. Either way, there's problems at home. Okay. And then there's the withdrawn, rejected uh, kids that are disliked because they're timid, uh, you know, they're anxious, they're shy. That's the way my wife was, by the way, you know, very shy and timid, right? Uh, they also have problems regulating their emotions, right? They're fearful and they, you know, they're very shy and, you know, they shouldn't be so fearful, so shy, right? But they have problems uh, regulating their emotions. They also tend to experience mistreatment at home. You know, um, you know, some children withdraw and become shy and timid when they have problems at home and some children become aggressive. My wife became the withdrawn, rejected type. And the problems that she had at home, well, her parents broke up and then her mom was all depressed and a heavy smoker. And her mom was so depressed that she was in bed all the time. And since my wife was seven years old when she was a kid, basically, um, you know, she kind of had to fend for herself. She had two older sisters, but they were older, were teenagers, and they were out with boys and partying and stuff like that. But my wife said that she had to basically, you know, um, you know, just learn to take care of herself. You know, she watched a lot of TV and she stayed in the apartment. They were poor. Um, and as far as dinner and things like that, she had to basically get some frozen food and put it in the microwave. You know, not, not a very good diet because her mom was all depressed and was in bed the whole time, almost basically um, disabled, not physically, but mentally. That's, that's what she experienced. Those are your withdrawn, rejected kids. I wasn't either of those. I think I was average, by the way. Uh, let's see what's next. I think bullying is next. Yes, bullying is, is next. And that's a whole another subject that's very interesting. And we'll leave that for next time. Okay, let me go ahead and stop recording.